Hello, I'm A.B. Curtis. I'm the author of this book, The Little Chapel That Stood. It is a book about 9-11, the fall of the Twin Towers when the World Trade Center was attacked by Islamic terrorists who actually hijacked four commercial airliners and flew two of them into the Twin Towers, bringing them down. I'm going to read to you the entire text of the book and show you all the pictures so you will have the complete book for your school or library. But before I do that, I want to briefly talk about some of the events of September 11th and why we should remember them. I also want to tell you something about the history of St. Paul's Chapel that miraculously survived, although it was less than 100 yards from the World Trade Center. I'd also like to tell you a little bit about the unusual history of the book itself. If you're not familiar with that little chapel in Manhattan, this low building right here, I hope you can see it, was number one World Trade Center. It was less than 100 yards from this little wooden steeple of St. Paul's Chapel. All of these buildings came down, or had to be taken down because they were considered too dangerous, and not a pane of glass was broken in this little chapel. So it became the service depot for all the rescue workers. And the amazing thing to me about this little chapel is that not only Alexander Hamilton, but George Washington were members of this church. It's the oldest continually functioning building in the city of New York. Nobody expected it to survive. It was built in 1766, 10 years before we even became a country. As a matter of fact, when it was built, it was called the Church of England and was part of the London Parish because, of course, George Washington was a member of the Church of England before the Revolutionary War. As a matter of fact, when George Washington was elected our first president, because, of course, New York City was our first capital until the British burned it in 1776, after he was inaugurated, to be our first president, he walked down Broadway. This is Broadway right here, and four blocks down here is Wall Street. He walked down Broadway to this very chapel to offer his prayers for the new nation. Many of you who are listening to me today weren't even born when September 11th happened, which has become known simply as 9-11. But you'd be surprised to know that millions of people just remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they heard that the Twin Towers had been attacked by planes. I was born in New York City, but I had long ago moved to California. But my mother, who still at that time lived on the East Coast, called me. I was sound asleep at 6.30 in the morning. She said, sweetie, you have to turn on the television set. A plane has just hit the Twin Towers. So of course I did. And I sat there absolutely aghast at the horrifying events unfolding before my eyes. It was surreal. I mean, you couldn't believe it was happening, and yet, of course, it was happening. It was horrifying. I, um, I, I felt helpless. I felt, I, I was just, didn't know what to do. As a matter of fact, for the next three days, I, I was just, it was going through my mind. And finally, because I'm a writer, I guess, I decided to sit down and write about what I, what I saw, what I heard, what I thought and what I felt about it. And I s emailed this little poem of mine to my children and grandchildren. And one of my daughters called me and she said, Mom, you, you have to make a children's book about this. And I said, of course I can't make a children's book. It's horrifying. Of course I couldn't. She was very insistent because, of course, I've written many children's books before this. I was still saying that it, I couldn't possibly write about such a horrifying event in a children's book. She was so insistent that I finally talked to my husband and he said something very, I thought, very profound. He said, well, you want to protect children from danger, from terrorism, certainly, but you do not want to protect them from courage and bravery. And I thought, 
Yes, that, that is true. I still was hesitant, however. I usually write my books all by myself in my garret, writer's garret. I, um, but I contacted St. Paul's Chapel and I told them what my daughter had suggested, that I expand my little poem into a children's book. I said, however, I don't want to do it alone like I've done my other projects. I, I feel like I need to do it in a community of other people because it's such a, it's, it's a very delicate thing, people's feelings that we're dealing with. And if they were interested, and they did respond, they were not only interested, but very enthusiastic. And so I worked with St. Paul's for over a year and did finally publish the book. Um, although Hyperion had published uh, my book, my last book, I couldn't interest any publishers in doing it. So I self-published it. And I was very surprised that um, the Smithsonian Institution actually chose the little chapel that stood as the feature book in their Our Story program about 9-11 for schools and libraries. And I was further honored by the fact that they um, they described the book this way. They said, this is a wonderful work of children's literature that balances historic fact with an uplifting message. Its powerful narrative makes it a perfect fit for a new Smithsonian Our Story module about a difficult anniversary. And I, as a matter of fact, the other thing, um, I really thought I had done the right thing when um, the uh, St. Paul's Chapel, when I published the book, had a news conference and a book signing for me in Manhattan. I was very scared because um, I hadn't really, uh, I didn't know what the public response was going to be. And uh, the first the young man who came up to my table was not interested. He didn't even read the book. He picked it up, put it down, and walked away, and my heart just sank. And then, uh, but the next person that came up was um, a middle-aged woman who uh, opened the book and read one or two pages, and then she asked me if she could sit down. I was in the church book signing in the chapel and uh, at a little distance from the pews, and she asked if she could go and sit down and read the book, and I said, of course. In a few minutes, she came back and she said, I just want you to know that I lost my daughter in the North Tower and I think that this is a beautiful memorial of my daughter. And I just, I, I thought, okay, I, I, I feel like I have done the right thing. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I just recently this year signed a licensing agreement with the 9-11 Museum at the World Trade Center. They are going to read the book and make a kind of film adaptation of it for their education program. And it was, at, maybe a first for a children's book. It was chosen by Duquesne University. It was declared a, a historic artifact by Duquesne University. And that may be a first for a children's book. I don't know. And also, which may be a first for a children's book, it was uh, the subject of a doctoral thesis. And in the, <clears throat> the researchers went to uh, various schools and uh, asked a series of questions about 9-11 that the students answered. And then they left a, a copy of the book, the little chapel book. And uh, they came back later and asked a, another series of questions about 9-11. And they found that after reading the book, school children talked about 9-11 less in terms of death and destruction and more in terms of the courage and freedom of the American people. I was also contacted by a New York City school teacher who said the book inspired him to start an organization that taught the founding documents and the principles of capitalism uh, as an elective after school project uh, with hands on um, entrepreneurial projects uh, for the students in Harlem. But the, the, really, I guess, I don't know whether to call it strange or not, but the most unusual thing that happened that I'm sure is a first for a children's book, somebody told me that it saved their client's life. I was book signing in Manhattan, and this nice-looking gentleman uh, asked 
for a book. And I picked one up and uh, started, opened it up, started to sign. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm signing the book for you. He said, you're not the author of this book. And I said, well, yeah, actually, I am the author of this book. And he said, well, in that case, I want to thank you for saving my client's life. And I was totally confused. What in the world was he talking about? So I asked him if he could explain kind of what he meant. And he said, well, I will tell you, I am the lawyer in charge of the defense, or I was in charge of the defense for Zacharias Musawi, also known as the 20th hijacker. I was sure he would be found guilty as the only person ever to be brought to trial for 9-11. However, I thought the best I could do for him was to get him life instead of death. But everything was going against us. Uh, survivors and grieving relatives uh, came to testify with terrible videos, graphic horror going on. Even Mayor Giuliani came to testify. Everything was going against us. And then I ran across your book, and uh, I have a friend who's a teacher, and I picked up your book in his classroom. He said, your book turned that around. In your book, America is not a victim. In your book, everybody pulls together. People rush into the city to help. The mayor and his staff don't secret themselves in some safe bunker. They come out with everybody else into the street to, to marshal the defenses of the, for the city. Uh, firemen uh, come from other states to uh, help with the rescue effort. Even little children raise flags and uh, uh, wave flags and have thank you signs for passing firemen. In those days, uh, having an a, a American flag in the public schools was not considered an insult to anyone. So your book, he said, he turned it around. In your book, America is not a victim. In your book, America is a great nation. And as a great nation, it can afford to be merciful. Well, I was not entirely sure at the beginning of that conversation whether I wanted to save the life of a terrorist or not. But the lawyer was right. America is a great nation. And as a great nation, it can afford to be merciful. And now I would like to read the book to you. The Little Chapel That Stood. Around the chapel of old St. Paul blow the dancing leaves of the coming fall. In the morning breeze they leap and fly beneath the towers that scrape the sky. George Washington's family worshipped here. Alexander Hamilton's grave lies near. Since 1776 has stood this house of God and bricks, solid and steadfast as time whirled around it unchanged since horse and carriage found it. A solace to presidents, help to the poor. No one was ever turned from its door. An immigrant's refuge, a sojourner's peace, where hope is born and sorrows cease. As the centuries passed and the city grew dense, its buildings grew higher and wider, immense. And tallest and grandest, the city's great pride, the New York Twin Towers rose up by its side. The stress of power, the rush of people, found comfort and rest beneath its steeple. But doom, doom was coming all the time. Doom, doom to a city fair and fine. Doom, doom was in the plains that climbed doom, doom, and then the sirens whined. Two planes hijacked by a terrorist crew struck the Twin Towers. No warning, no clue. Who thought it could happen or knew what to do? Firemen came and New York's men in blue. Through the flying glass and smoke and din, thousands rushed out as these brave men rushed in. On the stairwell to safety, there was no stranger. Each helped the other flee from the danger. And some who climbed down remember clear-cut. 
the faces of firemen climbing up. And then, oh, unthinkable thought, they fell. One tower, the other, they fell, fell, fell. They fell with a rush and they fell with a roar. The sky was blank where they'd been before. And more was lost than who can say. It was our hearts that came down that day. Through the clouds of black, no one could see how far spread this calamity. The giants around it had come to a fall. But not the chapel of old St. Paul. It was something of wonder, a symbol of grace. The steeple still there, not a brick out of place. Some say the giant sycamore wood had saved the little chapel that stood. The old chandeliers that they'd packed away through two world wars, they did not sway. Then the crystals reflected a busy scene when the doors opened up to the rescue team, there were firemen's shoes on the old iron fence where they'd earlier hung them in haste, quick and tense as they pulled on their boots and raced to the towers, climbing melting steel to flaming showers. Oh, what gallant men did we lose who never came back to get those shoes. Ground Zero smoldered dark and grim. Our hearts stood still, then we pitched in. Helpers brought shovels and pails or pans. If they had nothing else, they dug with their hands to clear the mountain of crumpled steel from a nightmare that was all too real. New York is the greatest city in the world, said the mayor. It has the greatest people, and we will never let a bunch of terrorists make us fearful. Rescuers worked through the night and the day. In the chapel, they'd pause, then go on their way. A hot cup of coffee, something to eat. Here firemen, welders, policemen would meet. All would come to rest from their labor. Volunteer, doctor, brother, neighbor. Policemen and firemen led the way but other heroes braved that day. Passengers flying on Flight 93 said goodbye, I love you to their family and fought the terrorists right to the ground. Was the White House where their plane was bound? We raised up the flag from the dust and the pain. Freedom that's lost must be won again. Each one of us is a link in that chain to do something grand or to do something plain. First we take heart, then we take aim. Our littlest good deed is never in vain. Working together is how we got through it. Little by little, we learned how to do it. It's nice to be big and it's nice to be tall, but sometimes being little doesn't mean being small, just like the chapel of old St. Paul. Hear the bells of freedom and what they say. Terror may come, but it will not stay. It will shake our world, but we will not sway. It will block the path, but we'll find our way free beneath the stars that shine both night and day. And of course, these are the stars that shine both night and day, the stars in our flag. I think that this book, The Little Chapel That Stood, does help us remember 9-11. And we need to remember it because we cannot forget that America has enemies that want to destroy our way of life, destroy the freedoms that we enjoy, especially the freedoms that women and young girls enjoy in this free society. And I think the, the other thing that it, it, it reminds us how Americans are generous and brave. They come together in an emergency. I remember I told you that the hijackers hijacked two pla uh, four planes and flew two of them into the Twin Towers. The other one plane they flew into the Pentagon, but the other plane, because of their cell phones, they heard what was happening. And just ordinary citizens, ordinary American citizens, took it upon themselves to bring that plane down. That's what Americans do. They, they're generous and they're brave and they do what they have to do even, even during the, the worst part of the, the, the Twin Towers. Perfect strangers helped each other down the stairs to safety at the risk of their own lives. 
It shows us that although terror and war and violence come upon us, they are insubstantial and temporary. But the heart of the American people, the courage and freedom in the heart of the American people is deep and abiding.